This is Gareth Evans recording some memories on the 40th anniversary of the Australian Law Reform Commission. I remember with great nostalgia and affection my time on the ALRC 40 years ago. Although it was in fact an exceedingly brief time, I was appointed by Lionel Murphy as one of the first batch of members on the establishment of the Commission in January 75. Then I worked furiously throughout that year as a part-time member and for a few weeks in fact as the first full-time member after Michael Kirby particularly on the Commission Report Number 2 on Criminal Investigation, on which I was the lead author, a magnum opus of over 200 pages, which we completed rather extraordinarily in less than three months, uh, between May and August '75. Then, after all that flurry of activity, I resigned on the 15th of November, because I had to, under the Constitution, if I was going to contest um, the election, which followed the dismissal of the Whitlam government which I did contest in an unwinnable position on the Victorian ALP Senate ticket. Notwithstanding what I think it would be fair to say was the manifestly non-ideological nature of my contribution to the work of the Commission in '75, and also the quite firm support of my former colleagues for my reappointment to the Commission following my utterly expected election loss, that reappointment, I'm afraid, proved a bridge too far for the new Attorney General, Bob Ellicott, who took what we might now describe as a rather Peter Credlin-like view about the appointment of political opponents to statutory positions. So that less than 11 months was it, so far as my membership of the Commission was concerned. But what a first year it was. Michael Kirby took to his new role as chairman like a duck to water. He always claimed in later years that he would have been the very model of a quiet, retiring, unassuming and inconspicuous judicial chairman had I not tutored and encouraged him in the dark arts of public communication, public advocacy. But I have to say he didn't need much persuasion. The Commission made his public presence felt from the get-go. Um, partly, I think that was because of the first references we took on, complaints against police, criminal investigation, alcohol, drugs and driving. All of them had a little bit more media appeal than cattle trespass, easements, bills of lading, sort of things which seemed to have been the staple up until then of the state law reform commissions. But partly also it was because of the public hearings that we held, very high profile events, eight of them I remember all around the country in the course of the criminal investigation reference alone. And Michael's commanding role during those hearings and more generally as chairman and communicator in chief, full of the most splendid pietas and dignitas and gravitas, but also of course the most marvellous ebullience. My fellow first members of the Commission were a wonderful group, individually and collectively. There was Gordon Hawkins, the Sydney University criminologist, languid, mischievous, terrific intellect, wit. Alex Castles from Adelaide, uh, boisterous, engaging, a mine of information on legal history, some of it even relevant to our references. Uh, there was John Kane, Victorian solicitor and then executive member of the Law Council of Australia, a model of sturdy common sense and high principle qualities which I think he later showed in abundance when he became Victorian State Premier in the 1980s. And then of course there was Jerry Brennan, uh, then a senior Queensland barrister, but later to become the very properly exalted Sir Gerard Brennan, 10th Chief Justice of the High Court. Jerry Brennan, with whom I had a number of quite spectacular rows on the Commission over the substance of the Criminal Investigation Report. Jerry took the view, quite rightly, that I, then a 31-year-old Melbourne University academic, bearded, long-haired, full of high-principled civil liberty zeal, really didn't know an enormous amount about the real world of coppers and courts, and that unless and until one had years of criminal trials under your belt, so, Jerry, you couldn't pronounce with any conviction on the rules of search and seizure, arrest and interrogation, and all the rest of the things that might be appropriate for the proposed new Australia Police Force or anyone else. I took the view that Jerry was being a teensy bit conservative about some of the changes that were needed, and so we went at it hammer and tongs, meeting after meeting, until we finally came up with a report, which I think most people did agree made quite a serious and important contribution to the literature, even though much of it never saw 
legislative light of day. The important thing about that commission is that while all of us had our various corners and fought for them, our fights, even mine with Jerry, which were by most recollections the most exuberant, they, they were really conducted in the nicest possible way, always focused on substantive issues with really not a hint of personal malice or spite. We did get on tremendously well together as a group, not least when we got together for some rather nicely lubricated dinners after commission meetings. And it was a happy as well as, I think, an enormously productive time for the new institution on the legal block. Looking to the future, it's now, frankly, so many years since I've practiced or worked with the law that any judgments I might make now about key challenges for Australian law reform in the next decade are quite as likely to be as unreliable as the judgments that Jerry Brennan used to think I made all those decades ago. But that said, I, I can't help thinking that an absolutely central theme for lawmakers and law reformers must be what in many ways it's always been, getting the balance right between the interests of state and citizen, especially at times of stress and anxiety about public safety. When it comes to our personal liberty, to meet who we want, to go where we want, to write and say what we want, to enjoy a large zone of personal privacy, free from intrusion, to avoid heavy-handed behaviour by security and law enforcement authorities, there will always be those who think that very large swathes of that liberty and privacy can properly be sacrificed in wartime or terrorist time or when other widespread fears are abroad. I'm not one of them, although of course I acknowledge that some new balances have to be struck from time to time, not least as technology changes. So I do hope the Australian Law Reform Commission maintains its tradition in the decade and more ahead of sturdy, intelligent, principled but practical independence on these issues. The tone that I think we struck in the very first year of our existence, 40 years ago this year.